In our last class, we introduced the agenda for the second half of our series entitled God's Answer to Our Unmet Needs. First, we talked about the diagnosis. We gave the diagnosis why we are where we are today in society, why people are the way they are, how people got so messed up to the point where I heard on the news today they found a three-month-old baby, another three-month-old baby uh, on Galveston. Something about Galveston. But a three-month-old baby, and they believe that the father is responsible. Things like this happen in this world. And the first half of this series was designed to, to demonstrate to us how we got there, how we got to the point where we would do such things. The second half of this series is designed to give the prescription. That is, what do we do about the world that we live in? What do we do about the issues that we have? The second part of this series, as I mentioned in our last class, is designed to answer four questions. First question being, does God know what's going on in my life? Does he know what's going on in the lives in the world? Is he aware of what's going on? Second question is, does he care? Does, care, does God care about all of the bad things that's happening in the world, about all of the pain and suffering, all of the issues that we have? Does he care? Third question is, can the broken lives that people have as a result of their unmet needs, can those broken lives be made whole again? Is there hope for people whose lives have been shattered by the circumstances of this life? And then the fourth question is, what do we do about the damage already done? What do you do about the fact that you've already experienced issues in your life? You've already experienced a lot of devastating things and it affected your life. What do you do about that? We closed the last class by answering the first question by giving you the suggestion that Jesus is the answer to our problem, that Jesus is met needs. And the balance of this series will be dedicated to proving that fact, proving to you that Jesus is, in fact, the answer to our unmet needs. And the method that I intend to use to prove this is to, number one, look at the qualifications of Jesus. What qualifies Jesus to be the answer to all of our issues? Then we're going to look at his mission. Why did he come here? I know the ready answer is to seek and to save the lost. That's the textbook answer. That is true. But he came to do much more than that. Then we're going to look at his ministry. How did Jesus minister to people? How did Jesus serve people while he was here on earth? And then we're going to talk about his person, understanding his person, who he is to us. And I believe that once we understand that Jesus is qualified, equipped, ready, and able to make us whole, then the ball is flipped back into your court. And you have to answer the question, do I want to be made whole? And are you willing to do what it takes to be made whole? Let's look at the questions of Jesus. Why do I believe that Jesus Christ is qualified to be God's answer to our unmet needs. You familiar with the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18? You remember when Jesus, after he had been raised from the grave, the scripture said that he called his disciples together and he gave them what we come, what we have called the Great Commission. And Jesus said in that statement, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Isn't that what he said? All power had been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Is why did Jesus have this power and what did he do with it? Have you ever wondered why Jesus performed the miracles that he did? Have you ever wondered why he healed the sick and cleansed the diseased, raised the dead? Um, have you ever wondered? I know the scriptures teach in John chapter 20, verse 
verses 30 and 31, that he did this thing that we may believe that he's the son of God and that believing on him we may have life. But it's more. Jesus demonstrated in the miracles that he performed his power over the issues and circumstances of life. Jesus performed miracles by healing those who were sick. Isn't that right? And there are all kinds of sicknesses. There is physical sickness. Emotional sickness, mental sickness, even spiritual sickness. Jesus demonstrated that he has the power, that whatever your sickness is, he has the power to fix it. He performed miracles by uh, cleansing those who are diseased. And disease, by definition, is something that fun- does not function the way it was designed to function. Jesus demonstrated that when we talk about heart disease, we're talking about a heart that does not function the way it was designed to function. Jesus demonstrated that he has the power to get us back functional when we've been made dysfunctional. Jesus quieted storms. He told the storms to be still, to be quiet. And they were quiet. Isn't that right? That has to do with nature. We have no control over nature. Jesus demonstrated that he has power over things that we do not even have control over. There are a lot of things that happens to us in our life that we have no control over. Jesus has the power to control that which we cannot control. Jesus performed miracles by raising the dead. Death by definition is a separation. When the spirit leaves the body, that constitutes physical death. When we sin, and get out of fellowship with God, we are separated from God. Jesus demonstrated that he has the power to restore relationships, that he can bring back together what was once separate. Brothers and sisters, Jesus has the power. He has the power to supply all of our needs. He has the power to calm all of our fears. And he has the power to handle all of our issues. Whatever your issue is, Jesus has the power. Second reason why Jesus is qualified is in the it's in the answer to what Jesus called himself. Pass these out. Look at some of the things that Jesus called himself. John chapter six, verse thirty five, the Bible says that Jesus called himself the bread Life. Anyone know the significance of that? Why himself the bread of life? What is significant about bread? I'm a meat man myself, so bread don't mean a whole lot to me. At least it didn't until I studied this. Let me paint the picture. John chapter 6, Jesus had just finished performing a miracle. He fed 5,000 people with two small fish and five barley loaves. And Jesus told some of the people who followed him, you didn't follow me because I performed the miracles that I performed. You followed me because I fed you. Look at what he says in John 6, verse 26, beginning. And Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perished, but for that meat which entereth into ever, that endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Verse 35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And if you read all the way down to verse number 15, and that he talks about what Calvin talked about, God did feed the children of Israel manna from heaven when they crossed through the Red Sea. But he said they ate that, but they still died. He said those that partake of me. Here is the point. Bread in that culture was the essential element of the meal in that culture. Here is the point. Without bread, no meal. Jesus is saying without meat. There's no life. 
Just like bread was the essential element of meal, of the meal, I am the essential element, the essential component of life. Without me, you have no life. Even though you live around, you have no life. That's one. I'm just going to give you a handful. I'm not going to go through all of those. Here's another one. Uh, he called himself the true vine. Well, let me back up to bread one second. Jesus was tempted on the mount. Uh, the devil tempted him. He said, if thou be the son of God, turn these stones to bread. And what did Jesus say? Thou shalt, it is written, thou shalt not live by what? Bread. bread. Alone. You know what he's saying? Bread is essential. Bread is important. But bread is not all you need. You need physical bread to sustain your physical life. But you need the spiritual bread, the word of God, to sustain your spiritual life. Okay? Bread, physical bread, has its place. But the most important is that which is spiritual. Here's another thing he called himself. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Verse 1. He said, I am the true vine. Ye are the branches. Again, as Sister Collins said, they related to that because he took something out of their culture that they were familiar with, that they understood, and they could apply, they can get the lesson out of it. The vine is very important because if you disconnect the branches from the vine, the branch dies because the vine is the power source. It's the source of nourishment, of energy, of life to the branches. And if you disconnect it from the, the branches can't bear fruit. Isn't that right? right? Now notice he says he is the true vine. Mm -hmm. Which implies that there are some vines. Mm -hmm. See that word true means genuine. Mm -hmm. It means original. It means the real deal. Mm -hmm. But there are some vines that's counterfeit today. That's how Satan works. There are some counterfeit vines. There are some vines and Satan is very crafty and he has a lot of people believing that some of these vines they believe to be the true vine or not. Here's another thing he called himself the good shepherd. John chapter 10 verse 11. Jesus says I am the good shepherd. Now, and he but lays down his life for the sheep. Why is that significant? Because when you understand the shepherd sheep relationship, then you can understand what the Lord is talking about. You see, a shepherd totally took care of his sheep. Something about the nature of sheep. Sheep are defenseless. They have no sense of direction. They have no built in defense mechanism. So they are totally vulnerable. Shepherd to God, they need a shepherd to provide for them. They need a shepherd to protect them. And that's why David used that analogy in Psalm 23, you know, 23rd Psalm. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd. Because he's my shepherd, I shall not want. That's right. That's right. Then he goes on to describe how you know, the Lord as a shepherd protects him, takes care of him. Jesus does all of these things, brothers and sisters, for his sheep. When we understand the shepherd sheep relationship and that we are sheep in the shepherd's fold, we don't have anything to worry about because we know that our shepherd is going to take care of us. He's going to provide for us. Isn't that right? He's going to direct us. Sheep are dumb animals, y'all. You can take a hundred sheep to the cliff, to the edge of a cliff. If one jump off, they're all going to jump. That's dumb. <laughs> But the scripture says all we like sheep have gone astray. A lot of us jump off the cliff. <laughs> we just as dumb as sheep. <laughs> Book says, right? That's why we need a shepherd. Amen. That's why we need to follow the shepherd. And in that analogy in John chapter 10, he makes another comparison between the shepherd and the hireling. Yeah. See, the hireling mm. is someone who's just paid to tend to the sheep. He has no personal interest in the sheep. So when danger comes, 
The hireling is going to say, hey, you, you don't pay me enough to risk my life for these sheep. So he will take off, but the shepherd will give his life for his sheep. The shepherd has a personal, intimate relationship with his sheep. You see? Big difference. Another thing the Lord called himself. And you see how, how what the Lord calls himself? You see how this factors into him being the answer to our unmet needs? Because if we have, if we have need of protection, of provision, Jesus says, I'm it. Right? If we have need of Jesus says, I'm the source. Right? If we had need of that which is essential for life, I'm it. All roads point to Jesus. He also said, I'm the light of the world. What does light do? It dispels darkness. What else? Hmm? It guides. If we were to shut all the lights off and somebody pulled the alarm, we'd have some hurt people in here. Because y'all be running into stuff, running into each other, because you can't see to get out of here safely. Jesus said, I am the light. Not only is he the light, but he said, we are light. We are the light to the world. Isn't that right? The, the world should see us by our influence. They should see God, who is the true source of light. We're just reflectors, reflecting his light, right? One more. He said to do what with your light? Let it shine. Let it shine. Which tells me that you control whether or not your light shines or not. Mm -hmm. You can stop your light from shining. Yes. Isn't that right? That's one that I had down here for what Jesus called himself. Then we'll tie it all in. Uh, Jesus called himself the mediator between God and man. In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, Timothy says that there is one mediator, man and God, the man Jesus Christ. Isn't that right? Where is the Father? Where does he reside? In heaven, right? Jesus was, well, where is man? Man is on earth, right? Timothy said there is one mediator between man and God, and that's who? Jesus Christ. The only way to get the Father is through the Son. You cannot get from here to here by bypassing Jesus. Can't do it. The thing about a mediator, a mediator is a person who stands between two parties, but he's familiar with both parties. He's familiar with, in this case, Jesus is familiar with the Father, familiar with man. Why? Because he was 100% God and 100% man. So he identifies need for holiness. You know, he identified with God. He also identified with man because he walked in man's shoes and he understands the, the things that man go through. So he's totally qualified to stand between God and man and bring God and man back together. But it's only through him. It's crafty. People believing you can get to the Father by bypassing Jesus. There are some people who teach that Jesus was, he was even a prophet, but he's not nothing special. That's not what the book teaches. The book teaches that he is the way. In fact, Jesus said, no man coming into the how, but by me. He is the way. Isn't that right? I asked y'all this once before. How many of y'all have issues? How many? How many of y'all have issues? Uh, everybody didn't raise their hands. The ones who didn't, and they issue with lying. <laughs> I'm just playing. I'm just playing. I don't want to be upset with me. We all have issues, brothers and sisters. We all don't have the same issues. Some of us have wounds. 
Some of us have wounds that go deeper than others. We all have something that we struggle with, that we're dealing with. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus is the answer. He's got the power. He is qualified. He's ready. He's willing. He's able. Isn't that right? Next week, we're going to look at his mission. We're going to talk about why Jesus came to this earth. And then the following week, we're going to look at his ministry. Because he was anointed to come and to deal with our issues. The Bible says in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, Jesus said that he was anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. To set li- at liberty those that are captives. To heal the brokenhearted. Jesus came to do these things. A lot of sisters have broken hearts, walking around with wounded hearts because of things that have happened to them. Jesus came to fix that. Al Green can't fix it. That's right. He can ask the question, how to the broken heart? But you notice he didn't give the answer because he doesn't have the answer. The answer to how you mend the broken heart is J-E-S-U-S. That's right. That's who can heal. A lot of people have are, are slaves to addictions, you know, they are slaved to addictions. Jesus came to set you free mm. from those addictions. Jesus came to give sight to the blind. There are a lot of people who, have de- who are deceived, who are blinded by, by whatever. Jesus came to restore your sight. He came to set us free from all of these things. Your hands up, bro. Just as God is in the business of providing for our needs, Satan is in the business of counterfeiting what God has provided for us. The plan that God has, Satan has a counter plan. And he's very proficient in these little deceptive maneuvers, devices that he uses. And sometimes it looks so close to the truth that you can't recognize it unless you know the truth. And I've used this analogy before. If you do not know what a, what a genuine diamond looks like, you can be fooled by a counterfeit. Amen. You have to know what the original, what the genuine looks like before you can identify a counterfeit. That's why we have to be in this book, y'all. Because this is what helps us to determine what's real and what's not real. God has given us what's real. And Satan will come so to real. That if you don't know any better, you can be deceived. One final scripture, two. Hebrews chapter four. Someone else get he, uh, Ephesians chapter two. Let me show you something else about Jesus. <clears throat> Why he's qualified. Hebrews chapter four, beginning with verse 15. Someone else get Ephesians two, beginning with verse 11. Verse 14, Hebrews four, verse 14. Jerry, you have it? Uh, Give me the mic, bro. Hmm? Okay. Okay, who's got Hebrews 4? Sure. Hebrews 4, verse 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Mm-hmm. We, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Thank you. You see why Jesus is qualified? Because number one, the Hebrew writer said, we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity. In other words, he cannot, we have a high priest who sympathizes with what we go through. Why? Because he's gone through it. Remember I told you about the mediator, he, he relates to both sides. Jesus relates to us because he's been tempted just like we are. Everything, you know, every temptation that we face, Jesus has faced it. And what he did was he left us an example as to how to deal with that temptation. And because he had these temptations and because he was victorious and not succumbing to these temptations, the book said that we can boldly go through the throne of grace and ask for help, ask for mercy and grace 
to help us, right? Why? Because he understands. Been there, done that. He knows what you're going through, right? Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, mm -hmm. that at that time you are without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Mm -hmm. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are once were far off have been brought new by the blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. Keep reading, down to 16. For he himself is our peace, 18. who has made us both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that we might reconcile them both to God in by one body through the cross, thereby putting in death to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you and we're all off in parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fulfill all things. Thank you. <clears throat> Paul here reminds these Ephesian Christians of who they are. He says in verse 11, Wherefore remember that at times past, you were Gentiles, you were without God, you were without hope in this world. He says, but now in Christ, we are no more strangers. We are now fellow heirs of the promises that God made to Abraham. We are now in covenant relationship with God. The wall that was separating us and God, sin had been broken down. The wall that was separating Jew and Gentile have been broken down. We are now all reconciled in one body, that's the church, in Christ. You see, Christ came to accomplish all of these things. This is deep, y'all. This, this is some deep stuff. It really is. Any questions, comments before we close out? Next week, the mission of the Lord. Why did he come to this earth? Incidentally, off the top of your head, other than he came to die for our sins, Tell me, why did Jesus come here? Oh, you got that because I just read that. <laughs> I just read that. You're right, but I just read that. I didn't hear you read it. All right. All right. Well, that was the easy one because I just read that. And that was still in your mind, that one. Well, hold on, hold on a sec. What do you mean? What, what does that mean, reconcile? To bring us back to God. Bring us back. All right. The word reconcile means to restore to the original relationship. When, when man, when God created man, his relationship was perfectly harmonious. And when he sinned, that relationship was estranged, it was damaged. In Christ, that relationship is restored back to the original relationship. That's what reconcile means. Last scripture before, before we go, and then I'm going to give it to Jerry. Turn to uh, 1 Peter. And let me show you something right quick. First Peter, I think it's First Peter 2. First Peter 2, 21. <clears throat> and I've used this analogy before. Some of you are familiar with it. First Peter 2, 21 says what? He says, For he even hereunto were we called, because Christ suffered for us, leaving us what? An example that we should follow in his steps. Isn't that right? Word example is from a compound Greek word. Hupo gramas. That's what the word example means. The word hupo means under. Gramas means to write. The word literally means to underwrite or write under. What Jesus did was he came and he died. Well, well, he came and he lived and he experienced things and left us an example as to how to handle these things. Now, 
when you were in elementary school, those of you can remember that far back, when the teacher, and, and they described the copybook method of teaching a child to read and write. Remember the teacher used to write the alphabets on the board? Huh? And then would call the student to the board and the student would look at the teacher's alphabet. The teacher's alphabets were perfect alphabets. And the student would look at the alphabets and right up under the teacher's alphabet, the student would write his or her alphabet, looking at the teacher's alphabet as an example. That's what that word means. When we experience things in our lives, we look, at the, we look at the life of Christ. We look at the example of Christ. And then we pass our response after his response. That's why we have the record of all of these things that Jesus did. John, because it gives us an example of how Jesus handled things so that we can know how to handle these things. You see? And in the context of 1 Peter, he's talking about suffering unjustly. Jesus suffered unjustly, and he left us an example so that when we suffer unjustly, we can deal with it. We don't have to complain and murmur and cry and whine about it. Look at how Jesus handled it, and that's how we handled it. Next week, we talk about the mission of the lost church.